Hello and welcome to the 46th episode of Tailoring in Conversation. My name is Reza and in this series I'll be talking to tailors, business owners, cloth merchants and other industry participants from all around the globe to gain a better insight into their worlds. My guest for today is Paul Kruise. Paul is a bespoke jean maker based in Enschede, the Netherlands. One man, one machine, making one pair of jeans at a time. Let's go. Paul, uh, thank you for the time. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Um, let me begin by asking you how you're doing and where you are at the moment. Hi, Reza. Good to meet you, finally. Yeah. Um, I'm a card, okay? Thank you. Uh, hope you're doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in my home studio in Enschede. So, uh, where the action is done, actually. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. So, Paul, uh, I'm pretty sure that most people who have been looking up jeans or anything that is uh, in the category of handmade jeans are familiar with your work. But for those who haven't seen you or haven't heard of you, um, could you give us a little bit of a background story? Because I, I read that you come from a family that was involved in textiles and uh, your the city where you're at, Enschede, did have a, a history in textiles as well. Um, if you can walk us through that, that would be very interesting for me as well. Uh, it's a coincidence. I'm in Enschede. I, I was brought up in Groningen. Mm -hmm. You know the place up north? Yeah. Um, years ago, Groningen used to be known for making garments, especially coats and some suiting. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather once, uh, worked at a factory and became an e owner. I think mm -hmm. in, the, in the 50s, I think. Um, there, were quite, there was quite a lot of, of labor going on there. So it was, I think, the, the time when things were still affordable to make in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. I think the 50s, uh, everything went down in the 60s because of labor going to the mm -hmm. Far East and everywhere except the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So things started to, to decline then. And at that time, uh my father came my grandfather died halfway to 60s and my father took over the, the factory mm -hmm. and soon after that they shut down mm -hmm. they were just uh, ahead of bankruptcy so they, they shut down to prevent bankruptcy and uh, making sure that every workers had a good scheme to to go out and and need to go on the doll so to say so uh Mm -hmm. But in that time, most factories shut down in, in that area. Mm -hmm. My father mm -hmm. went into, uh, stayed in the, in, in the fashion clothing industry, but more as a, uh, an agent and uh, has been doing that since. Uh, and, but that was more the commercial side. I think my grandfather was, I think, started out as a window dresser and, and got into the factory, and in the, but also as a manager, I think. He was mm -hmm. kind of creative. My father was more a commercial man. And uh, so I grew up, I think, a bit with fashion in, in my surroundings. Mm -hmm. um, he, my father had some Italian brands he represented in, in the Netherlands. And I, I've always been interested in, in then in fashion. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in my late teens, I just started to find out things, you know, I got a sewing machine and uh, mm -hmm. tried to find out what I wanted to do. At that time, mm -hmm. it was probably working in, in fashion or, or in a store. I didn't really know what to do exactly, but mm -hmm. I did start out by just making making stuff, you know, um, mm -hmm. from scratch, just behind the sewing machine. Uh, mm -hmm. At a certain point, I did try to find someone to teach me things. So I got some lessons in pattern drafting. Mm -hmm. And how old were you at the time? I think about, must have been around 17, I think. 17, okay, okay. And um, I think my, I, I, I tried to find a course and I, it was Runeschau. Mm -hmm. I went to Amsterdam for that. And that was, I think Runeschau, as far as I know, is quite technical and it was, mm -hmm. I took some lessons, but it was way too fast for me, you know, too advanced. Mm -hmm. So uh, next I found uh, private tutoring in Groningen. Mm -hmm. 
someone mm -hmm. from the industry uh, and all the men who could who would teach me a bit more at my speed about pattern drafting. Mm -hmm. So he taught me about how to draft a pattern for uh, trousers and for a mm -hmm. coat, a jacket, mm -hmm. a coat. What, what do we call it? <laughs> yeah, a coat, a jacket, both, both coats. Yeah. So, uh, and at that period, I was, um, I, try, I learned to make quite a lot of things. You know, I, I had an old industrial machine, an old mm -hmm. puff, and I just made trousers, long coats, jackets, yeah. shirts, everything except mm -hmm. jeans, everything else. <laughs> right, right, right. And not the tailing way, not with canvassing, but just, you know, the construction, just, mm -hmm. it was a start for me. And uh, I think it was very nice to do, you know, just, just had some friends mm -hmm. who, who I would make things for and uh, see mm -hmm. where I got. And, yeah. uh, and it, it was still, uh, it was very nice in an old small atelier in Cologne where they used to make coats. Mm -hmm. one of the few remaining at that point in time we talk about around 1980 so mm -hmm. i could get nice fabric from them you know just to make very long overcoats so very nice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and when i got them finished i could go to the presser you really mm -hmm. just give them the final press so that would really elevate uh, the result very nice mm -hmm. but at certain points you know you're at your top and what you can learn yourself so i needed mm -hmm. to to decide what to do next. And, and I think tailoring wasn't an issue, not an option. I didn't know mm -hmm. any tailors. Uh, so it was still a bit about fashion more or less. And um, mm -hmm. so thinking of, I, I never wanted to go to art school because it was too, I found it too superficial to, to I'm, not, I'm just trying to, it wasn't my thing, you know, but mm -hmm. still in order to, to, to get any further, I decided I did have to go there. So I applied for Arnhem Art School and uh, for the fashion department. And I went there in, let me see, 88. Mm -hmm. And I soon found out it wasn't the right place for me to go to <laughs> because I didn't How like come? it. Huh? It was too, like I said, too superficial. You know, everything is around so collections uh, lasting for a few months and then mm -hmm. onto the next thing. And I, I do like things to be more, well, sustainable or long lasting. Mm -hmm. um, so the step to go to art school was really the step for me to quit fashion, basically, mm -hmm. because then I just got into contact with uh, another department there, furniture design, furniture mm -hmm. product design. And I thought that was very nice because when you design something like a f furniture or whatever, it's longer mm -hmm. lasting, you know, it's, it, the processes are longer and it's, mm -hmm. it suited me better. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did afterwards. So I changed that department and um, and graduated as a designer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in '92. And um, so that was quite a change. And I've been working as a designer, self-employed for many years until mm -hmm. I just the circle came round mm -hmm. again and yeah. got back to to tailoring or making clothes again. Okay. Okay. I see. So. Um, you said that in the town that you grew up in, there was there used to be um, a, a lot of garment production uh, yeah. going on. And do you do you know what influence which country the Netherlands was influenced by in terms of classic fashion? So the suits that they had, what what was their main source of influence? I'm not sure because at that time I wasn't aware of what happened there. I was too young. It was before mm -hmm. my time, really. So mm -hmm. by the time I, got, I was born, it was already just ending over there. So I'm, I'm not sure. I see. I see. I'm, not, I see. I'm sure it's. I, I, I do remember my father and grandfather went to Italy for for fabrics. You know, so I'm sure it, it would be Italy for a grand uh, for right, a major right. part. Yeah. 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 And. Do you know if all the major cities in the Netherlands had uh, a lot of uh, garment manufacturing sites or was it just the, the northern part of uh, the Netherlands? Uh, I'm sure there were more. I mean, the town where I'm living now is was more focused on, on uh, producing cloth, fabrics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mainly also shirts and pajamas, for instance, but mainly the fabrics. 
We still mm -hmm. have the areas where they used to bleach the, the, the fabrics and uh, they're still named after the period. A lot of places are named after the families that owned all the industry yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, especially in this city and the cities around. And uh, and I'm sure there were more places in the Netherlands where they were producing, but I, I, because I'm from the northern part, I knew that. And, mm -hmm. and this was more the, the fabric side of, uh, of, of the industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, right. Okay, okay. So uh, you go through all the learning curves and then work as a freelance designer and then decide to... Uh, set up your own workshop and uh, begin the production of uh, handmade garments. How how did that transition go? What why did you decide to make, for example, what you are making now, which is mainly denim, but also workwear? Um, but why why not suits, for example? What was the main reason for that? I think you know uh, before I started doing this, I just um, I was designing and also had some jobs on the side and I just got back a bit into the industry by working at, at a, um, a business that would were, were make coats. So I just got a little bit back into the fashion business. I didn't like that at all. It was a horrible environment for me to work in. So it was short lived luckily, but it did. Mm -hmm get me to a point of saying I don't want to go back to designing I don't want to I don't want to be back to working for an employer for a boss I just want to do my own thing mm -hmm. it's a kind of a point in, in life where it's like a crossroad you know what I'm going to do mm -hmm. and at that time I thought from my late teens early 20s the only thing I knew was how to make things mm -hmm. bespoke not like the industry all I learned was how to make a specific uh, pattern based mm -hmm. on personal measurements. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, you know, I needed to focus, I think, and not try to do everything. It was, I think, too late for me to do proper tailoring mm -hmm. because that would be take, take too much time to really get to a certain level. And I do like to be good at things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'd rather be good at one thing than mediocre at a lot of things. So yeah, yeah. And you know, when you get older, you, you try to uh, you learn things. You know, mm -hmm. in my early days, when I started out, I was making my clothes. I was a musician. I did photography, and all things were a bit like okay, just dive in and mm -hmm. um, see where I get. You know, and at a certain point, you. you you get to your, your peak and you, you can't get any further. So mm. I realized now you really have to make sure that step one is just perfect before you go into step two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Back to basics. And yeah. To do that, I really had to focus. And uh, also, I think, um, try to limit myself. Mm -hmm. Limit and yourself. I, I limit myself to... to at first one thing and mm -hmm. not being from the industry i didn't have the standard training mm -hmm. i mean there's a lot of industry in the netherlands and also in denim and in jeans there are a lot of mm -hmm. brands that are settled here but i don't know them so mm -hmm. and i thought you know i've always been a, a denim and jeans lover so i thought well okay i could just start with that you know just just mm -hmm. focus on that and my way of working would be just that's what I decided going into the process. What would be just to um, try to find my own way of doing things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The first thing being make it bespoke. Mm -hmm. I mean, jeans are the ultimate mass product, mm -hmm. the ultimate industry product. So, what can I add? You know, I could make another yeah. brand, one of the mm -hmm. many small brand, and do what every else is doing. And how do you mm -hmm. compete? You know, it's, it's very hard to to to. Mm -hmm to add anything to the, to the industry or whatever. Mm -hmm. That was my interest. And um, so I thought, okay, maybe the ultimate thing is to have a mass produced garments and make mm -hmm. it bespoke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there weren't much around, you know, so mm -hmm. that could be my my personal thing. And next, I, there's the problem of, of, of machinery, of course, you know, 
Mm-hmm. At that time, yeah. many people started to do something like uh, artisanal things, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Around that time, people making bags or hats or whatever, and jeans yeah. makers were coming up. And the jeans makers all would have, you know, the same row of, of, of machines, all the vintage mm-hmm. machines. Mm-hmm. You need, I need about 10 to make a pair of jeans, and they all need to be vintage and a certain brand. And I think you'll be, you, most of them are just half the time working as a, me- as a mechanic, you know, to, to maintain the machines. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so well, hold on, let me get this right. They would need 10 machines, about 10 machines. Well, whatever, sew. you know, just, just a stitch, a double needle stitch, a surgery yeah. machine, a, a, yeah, lock, yeah, or yeah. a, a buttonhole machine or a hammer. Yeah. Uh, whatever, you know, a yeah. classical setup for, to make jeans involves yeah. multiple machines. Right, right. And up look, to 10? Uh, I think so. Uh, uh, some colleagues of mine who are more in the vintage stuff, they have dozens wow. of machines. And, and wow. their kick is to use as many machines as possible or one pair of jeans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I thought, yeah. well, first of all, I did, I did and I couldn't invest in machines. Yeah. So I just bought one machine, mm-hmm. straight stitch, single needle machine, a lock stitch, yeah. and uh, said, okay, this is what I have. Yeah, what uh, can I do with it? You know, how can yeah. I just adapt the construction of a classic pair of jeans yeah and make it work for me with mm-hmm. one machine mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so i uh, that was the thing you know and, and i spent my first year just trying to design or mm-hmm. think of a system that mm-hmm. would work for me mm-hmm. and would end up in a great product of course so it was the side of making patterns and how how can you control the pattern in such a way that you at the end get what you were after Mm-hmm. to begin mm-hmm. with and the construction should be just uh, perfect in a sense that everything should be covered you know you can't leave any any mm-hmm. seams open or whatever yeah and i didn't want to use a lock stitch or whatever everything mm-hmm. should be neat and tight and and, mm-hmm. um, and clean you know so that's what mm-hmm. i spent my time on the first year i found someone to help mm-hmm. me with um setting up my own system to make a pattern mm-hmm. i knew mm-hmm. runeshaw of course but that was I, you know my jeans are salvage mm-hmm. from salvage denim so the the grain of the fabric mm-hmm. is not center front it's on the side seam yes yes so everything you do in a pattern is mm-hmm. different differently distributed so you can't just use yeah. a mother and son runeshaw pattern to make a salvage jeans yeah 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 so i had help setting up my own system and mm-hmm. that took some time you know you need to find mm-hmm. out what are the basics to to set up your pattern yeah and what are the variations that will help you decide it, about a fit is it a slimmer fit or a roomy fit or whatever mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so that took me about a few months to, to play around with make samples and just see what the effect was and uh mm-hmm. Along and were you that, having it, clients at this time as well in that uh, year that you were developing? Not in the beginning. It was just for me making mm-hmm. st- stuff for myself and maybe one or two friends to mm-hmm. try them out. But at first, just just as a laboratory, you know, to, to, to make sure everything was covered, you know, everything was, mm-hmm. was dealt with in the mm-hmm. system. And, um, and in the technique, you know, everything in my jeans is, is closed. All the seams are felt, hand felt, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. everything is, is dealt with within the, within the construction. So mm-hmm. that's what I really mm-hmm. like. So if you turn it inside out, it's still very clean. Yeah. And I always am amazed that even the more expensive brands, mm-hmm. you, you find a three, 400 euro pair of yeah. jeans from a Japanese brand, you turn it inside out and it's, it's the same as, as a cheap one from Primark. Yeah, yeah, weird. That Construction is very wise. Weird. Yeah. That's very weird, you know? Yeah. And that bothered me. And so I think it's kind of a challenge to have everything just clean. And uh, mm-hmm. and I think that was goal for me also to make sure that I could find my own place in, in the system mm-hmm. and offer something that was unique to me. Yeah, yeah. So I, I ended up somewhere in the middle between um, small scale jeans maker mm-hmm. and tailoring mm-hmm. because I, I at first I thought I would be catering to the denim heads, you know, but in the, in the end, I mean, many denim heads are just quite conservative, they want the, the, the big brands, mm-hmm. yeah. And 
they want they want a, a brand mm-hmm. there is you know mm-hmm. and um, the, the jeans makers are mostly let's say working mm-hmm. as the industry only yeah. in, a, in a with a vintage kind of vibe you know machine yes. or whatever yeah so that's quite a strong feeling that you have in, in that area mm-hmm. well t- tailoring classic mm-hmm. tailors uh, I think much more focused on, on quality of the garments construction mm-hmm. techniques mm-hmm. so that is what I brought in mm-hmm. looking back mm-hmm. to make mm-hmm. it my own so it's, it's I think it's, it's somewhere in between yeah yeah and so obviously if you know how to make something uh, technically that's that's one side of the equation but now you are also uh, required to set up a shop and become a business and and also be partially a, a business person where did you get those insights and skills from was it something you already had or did you uh, had people who who kind of like guided you through that or did you just take a, a leap of faith and, and thought i'd just make the best of it and see how it goes i think at that point um I thought it was best just to do what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I don't. Mm-hmm. I had jobs I didn't like, and you had to stay in a job just because you had to make a living. Mm-hmm. At a certain point, I thought, well, okay, now it's all the way. Just try, you know, try. If you want to do something good, you really need to 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 let down your other things. Just go all the way. Mm-hmm. And I always been. I I've always been one to to want to dive in. Mm-hmm. And to, uh, like I said before, uh, the only thing I, I didn't do it f- in my early days was just uh, really go go in deep technically. Mm-hmm. I was in a band. I could play a lot of things I wanted, but I couldn't read music. You know, I I, I couldn't right. tell you what I'm playing. <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. You can get a long way with that, but in the end, if you just uh, need to explain what you do, you can't. It's just mm-hmm. very feeling and of of. Musicality and the same here. I, I, I now decided I have to go to step one and mm-hmm. master pattern drafting. Yeah. And I really found out that when you do that, when you can master your own pattern, mm-hmm. you're done. You know, I used to just draw a pattern and I know, okay, these points I don't know, but we'll see when I'll get to that when I cut the fabric. Yeah. And then yeah. you cut <laughs> the fabric. Ah, okay, I'll leave for, for, for the sewing machine. <laughs> yeah. So you end up with things that don't match or that, that are not okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you, then you can still press it, press a bit, but it's still you have a problem. But the problem was there mm-hmm. at, at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And now I know, if I draw a pattern, mm-hmm. I know it's it's okay. Mm-hmm. So the good thing is, you know, once the pattern is okay, you don't have to think anymore about how you cut or how you mm-hmm. put together a thing. It's the, basically the work is done at the first mm-hmm. stage. I see. And that's I what see. I like, you know, that's what I learned. And I think in my first year, I just focused on that. And that gave me enough, I think, enough confidence just to mm-hmm. to do what I want to do. And to, mm-hmm. I just opened an Instagram account and uh, mm-hmm. made a website, had a website mm-hmm. made. And uh, I thought, well, I do like photography. I just take my own pictures mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. just show what I'm doing, you know, just yeah. Yeah. no marketing plan or whatever, no guidance mm-hmm. it's just see where it ends mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i must say uh maybe just because it's so specific people mm-hmm. just uh kind of responded to it mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. at first i think the denim industry a bit you know the small makers and then uh, and also mm-hmm. uh some people who were more to tailoring came to me because not because of the denim, but because yeah. of the attitude, I think. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that yeah, wasn't yeah. just being in between the denim world and the tailing world. So I, I now find most of my clients mm-hmm. are interested in tailoring. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There is. And so uh, it's, there was no there was no big plan. Just just uh, I do what I do best, and I show mm-hmm. it to you. And and if you like it, it's okay. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't have yeah, any yeah. plans. I, I I don't need whatever amount of customers or clients because mm-hmm. I'm, I work alone you know it's yeah, this is yeah. all there is so two hands and a machine and uh, mm-hmm. and I think at that point in time and still uh, it's it's a niche market it's a niche mm-hmm. within a niche 
Yeah. And that's big enough for me to handle. I'm always busy. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. no pressure. Mm -hmm. Everybody's patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People that come to me understand the process. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm, it's very nice, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself more as, uh, if, if you had to choose between the two, would, do you see yourself more as a craftsman on, uh, or artisan, or do you see yourself more as an entrepreneur? I'm a craftsman. Craftsman, for sure. Yeah, sure, because I, I'm not an entrepreneur. You know, I think an entrepreneur would be someone who wants to have a business and says, okay, I'm going to mm -hmm. sell oranges, or I'm going to sell tailoring, or I'm going to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. rent cars, you know. Uh, mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. this is really from what I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And the well, next step is sense. okay, you have to go out there and just mm -hmm. have people interested, get interested in this, but it's, uh, you end up being an entrepreneur, but that's mm -hmm. not the goal, no. Yeah, and so you work alone, you said. Yeah. How, how do you find that? Uh, is, is that something that has uh, for you more positives than negatives or is it quite well balanced or do you sometimes have moments that you think, ah, man, if I just had another person, this would be so much better. What, what, what is it looking like for you? In a way, I like it, you know, it's, it's, I can just work at my own pace. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think... If you would have someone else working, I mean, I don't want to be an employer to, to, to start sure. with, you know, but, but apart from that technical side, I mean, being in the same room <laughs> day by day with, with someone doing work, you need to be, you need to have a bigger space. And yeah, I think, um, especially now with internet and, and all these things, you know, there's enough um, to look at, you know, to get inspiration from, to, to get information from. Mm -hmm. So I, I, in that sense, I wouldn't want to work with a colleague. I don't mm -hmm. have any people working. I don't have time and room for an, an apprentice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it's just, it's just me, you know, and it takes the time it takes to get something done. And, and mm -hmm. the only thing is it's nice to just uh, talk about the trades now mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just to get a sense of what's around you and, and about the technical things and mm -hmm. how do you deal with this and, and I think that's that's hard we used to have a small group of people in, in this town where from different sides of the of the industry just meeting once a month just talking about things you know mm -hmm. but then mm -hmm. again that was three or four times and just fell apart again uh, that mm -hmm. always or often happens with those initiatives mm -hmm. i think yeah 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 but i do need i mean i do like to go to a like we have kingpins in the netherlands it's it's mm -hmm. a denim trade show it's, it's great to go mm -hmm. because it's more like a club you know it's it's mm -hmm. meeting people again uh ch chatting again twice a year so that's nice that's for the, for the social part mm -hmm. and it's inspirational that's nice mm -hmm. But yeah, a few yeah. times a year, it's, it's, it's enough for me. And yeah. uh, there's interaction with the, with the customers, with the clients, of course. And the one thing I do like, because I do, I, I am curious about techniques. And mm -hmm. I do have some books about tailoring, especially tailoring, you know, Italian mm -hmm. tailoring, English tailoring. I do like to just follow Instagram, uh, mm -hmm. YouTube videos about how does he do that, you know? How do yeah, you put yeah. it in the sleeve, whatever? Yeah. And then you find out everyone has their own system, but that's nice to think about, you know, and to, mm -hmm. to ponder about. It. And I, I can try to to use it all for my own work. There's mm -hmm. a colleague of mine, or ta an official tailor here in this this town, a young guy, and we're now mm -hmm. working on a coat for myself. I don't do any mm -hmm. coats. Yeah. Because I'm not a classic tailor, but I I do like them because mm -hmm. of the craftsmanship. And now we just are collaborating, so to say. Mm -hmm, I just mm -hmm. dug up my old uh, rune shop patterns and drew another pattern for a, a suit yeah. jacket. Yeah. And it, and it went quite well. And mm -hmm. he helped me with the canvassing, the, the color, things I couldn't do or mm -hmm, would take mm -hmm. me far too long to, 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 to really to learn to do. So, mm -hmm. and we just have these meetings just for, for fittings in between. Mm -hmm. And we just spent one or two hours just talking about, you know, Mm. Big stitching or whatever, or lapels, or, or yeah, the, the greatest stuff. You know, that that's inspiration. So that's very nice. Mm -hmm. And with all those things, it's for me fine just to be working on my own. 
Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Uh, I I think it was in 2019. I, I read a book called The Competitive Advantage of Nations by Michael Porter. And he tried to answer a question um, which was, why are some countries so good in, in certain industries? And he did like a very long research, like oh, like a, I think a 10 year old research with like a big team. And one of their findings was that the countries that become really good in a given industry are those countries that have, uh, instead of having separate companies, uh, they have clusters. So if there is, for example, uh, a printing industry, they used to have good access to good wood. They used to have good access to uh, factories that would process the wood into paper. Mm -hmm. Then they would have good ink producers and yeah. all of that. So do you feel that in your surroundings in the Netherlands at the moment, there is some sort of a foundation that uh, perhaps uh, increases the potential of, uh, of a garment industry uh, in the bespoke sector? I'm not sure. It's, uh, that's a hard one. I think, you know, there are some brands based in the Netherlands. Mm. I think that they are mostly, I think, that they're entrepreneurs, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're, they would be able to set up a brand or whatever, but it's, it's mostly their basics are commercial, I think. Setting up I something, getting the distribution right and, and also in the de in the denim industry or just fashion altogether. So I think mm -hmm. that's what I didn't like in the in, in the industry. I mean, I know some people who are just great mm -hmm. at just uh, setting up a brand, but mm -hmm. it's different to them making a garment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they all have the production, well, maybe Portugal or f further away, but it, it's yeah. a, it's a different thing altogether. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. so. I think the Dutch are quite good at that aspect, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the entrepreneurship and um, mm -hmm. also, I think, a design. Mm -hmm. A lot of brands or people are just quite good at design. There's, there's a, the Dutch are famous for the design also, yeah. I think, in, in some parts of, of the clothing, fashion. Mm -hmm. But if you just look at the technical side, tailoring, the mm -hmm. producing. Um, I think most tailoring died out years ago, but mm -hmm. some small companies are coming back, have been mm -hmm. coming back the last 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. like the mm -hmm. small makers, like the artisans. Mm -hmm. And I think a few, a few that I know here, are, I think it's the same. They just, they didn't start from one tailor just setting up a business, but they mm -hmm. often started out like a business. I see, I see. I focused see. on tailoring. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they would offer made to measure and, and, and mm -hmm. made to or made to measure and maybe bespoke, but mm -hmm. I think it would be just mainly um, the people starting the business are not tailors. Mm -hmm. So where do you get most of your supplies from? I mean, tools, fabrics, uh, trimmings, things that you generally use for the production of your garments. Uh, fabrics, mostly in Japan. Mm -hmm. I think all my denims are Japanese, so it's directly from the mill in Japan, sometimes through America. There's a mm -hmm. wholesaler there who has quite a good range. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, I don't keep too much stock. You know, I'm, I, Try mm -hmm. to limit myself again. You can have 50, 60 denims mm -hmm. to choose from, mm -hmm. and people just won't know what, where to begin. Yeah. What's the find, difference? You know, it, <laughs> well, yeah, okay. You can argue about that, but but still, I think if you just have a small range in different mm -hmm. ways and colors, different mm -hmm. shades more, it's, yeah. it's more than enough for people, you know. So I limit myself mm -hmm. to some fabrics that I find to be very good. Mm -hmm. um, so it's mostly Japan. Japan sometimes for shirting and some worker jackets, mm -hmm. maybe some Italian. Mm -hmm. um, England, of course, for the finer fabrics. Mm -hmm. um, I've made some worker jackets from tweeds or mm -hmm. finer wools, and that will be just England's garments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. So okay. those will be just the dams will just be on the roll of mm -hmm. more meters, you know, and, and just have some stock and the rest will be just to order for a specific mm -hmm. uh, commission. Yeah. Trimming it could be very hard. You know, I don't need a lot of things. I mean, if you're a tailor, you need all the canvassing and, and whatever you felt and, and mm -hmm. I do have some, but I just through uh, through England and London. Mm -hmm. uh, but for jeans, it's quite simple, you know. You just need your, your yarns and, and your threads, and that's it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's just uh, from the Netherlands. Yeah. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you is, you you are, let's say, uh, your workshop is pretty much you you are the the brand basically yeah. you are the company yeah. now where do you i mean most companies when they kind of like set out they set out with a mission to do something they want to you know either it's it's an economical mission or they want to change the world or whatsoever uh, you as as one individual artisan who produces everything where do you find your purpose in your work? How does your work satisfy you, uh, knowing that you are never going to be like a million sales a year? You're, you're not going to make large investments in the industry. You're not going to set up a, a, a denim making school or whatsoever. Although you may, I don't know. But, but as for now, being an individual artisan, where do you get your satisfaction from? I think it's mainly from just trying making the best I can and make it at point in time. You know, it's it's not like you say changing the world and beyond that. You know, it's all mm -hmm. you just have to do whatever, live your life the best you can, and and, and yeah. your scope is quite small in the end. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to set up a brand that changes the world or, or mm -hmm. redefines cotton production or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. it's important, but it's not for me. You know, I just try yeah. to do it within what I do. Mm -hmm. And I think making bespoke stuff is in that way sustainable because the clients that come to me just they don't just buy something and wear it once and throw it out. So it's it's a process for them as well. Mm -hmm. So I try to just make something the best I can uh, mm -hmm. with the clients, mm -hmm. hoping that they would really love what I do for them mm -hmm. and they usually do and and try to to be better than what they had before you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so if mm -hmm. they were used to to just um, of the red jeans mm -hmm. i know my first one pair i make them would be much better mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the second one even better than that you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so it's just focusing on on, on the on, on the crafts so to mm -hmm. say and for, for myself improving on that trying to get better yeah would you say that uh, it's similar to seeking perfection in the work that you do by doing it and doing it again and again and again and again and every time trying to beat yourself your previous self um, with the work that you have delivered basically I think you know every time you make a new pair let's say a jeans mm -hmm. okay this one's going to be perfect and you know in mm -hmm. the end oh my god failed again or yeah you know, huh? Yeah, there's yeah. always something. Even if it's the same thing, the same technique, there's always something you say. Oh, okay, it could have been better, mm -hmm. but it's still a good, a good one. So every time, next one, you mm -hmm. try to step it up a bit. And my jeans are just—it's a routine. And, and with the client, to talk about the measurements and what style they want. It's it, it's all mm -hmm. quite a classic and and and, and mm -hmm. jeans jeans, but still, do you want it a bit loose or regular and how hard the rise is important but still mm -hmm. within that you try to find perfection mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and all the uh the stitching is all the same you know so yeah you can't fail there but still you know there's always a feeling of you want to improve you want to improve and that's yeah i think for me making shirts and worker jackets is, is something that even uh, give me more room to to find mm -hmm. improvement because there's more mm -hmm. to choose mm -hmm. Um, especially with jackets, you know, what kind of pockets, what, what's the detailing, will it be lined or not lined? So there's more room for, mm -hmm. to choose for clients. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For me so to improve. How, how do you prevent 
yourself from getting bored. If you're making a very particular specific type of garment over and over and over again, because I can imagine some people think maybe making a few jeans is nice, but making jeans all the time. I, I could do that. You know, if, if it was mm -hmm. just jeans, mm -hmm. at a certain point, my, my whole system of the jeans was done, infected. Mm -hmm. So if we were to make you a pair, we would just decide on how to make it yours, but within, yeah. it would be within the system. Mm -hmm. So if I would only be making jeans, I would be bored at a certain point in time, sure. Mm -hmm. So that's when, at a certain point, I started, you know, as I say, once you go bespoke, you can't go back, you know? Yeah. It's for a client, you can't go back, it's addictive. Yeah. And also for a maker, you know, once I started making my own jeans and I started making my own shirts because I couldn't find a decent shirt that fit me mm -hmm. well, um, I started making it for myself, the same mm -hmm. process and in jeans, everything mm -hmm. should be dealt with and, and thought over. Mm -hmm. And at that point I started offering the shirts. Okay, yeah. now my shirt is done, I now can offer them to the clients and mm -hmm. the same with the worker jackets. and. So now I can just, my scope is widened a bit. Mm -hmm. it's, it's still quite compact, but still the variety in that, you know, keeps me going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, see. I do I like see. a certain routine to be, to make sure that I don't have to think about every step, every stitch, you know, mm -hmm. if, I, if I make something very new, I don't like to unpack and pick mm -hmm. things, you know? <laughs> uh, so sometimes for, for a client with specific demands, you know, you really have to think, oh, I'm going to solve this, you know, mm -hmm. make some samples. And that's nice. It's also frustrating, but it's okay. It will get you a step further. Mm -hmm. I have one client, a returning client, is very loyal, who really knows what I do and is, respects what I do, but always managed to just mm -hmm. take me one step further. Yeah, yeah. Just within my comfort zone, just over it, mm -hmm. but you, you wouldn't ask for things that I really don't, uh, let's say that would be going too far from, from what mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. But often I would just really have to try to find out how I'm going to make this, this kind of pocket, you know, a bellows pocket with whatever inverter pleats, whatever. I yeah, mean, yeah. I, I, never, I never did those in the beginning for jeans. So yeah. I would just have to go find out, get some yeah. books, get some videos and just yeah. try yeah, to yeah. find out. And that, that's the thing that keeps you going, that keeps you mm -hmm. just on your toes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I I had uh, when I started doing these interviews. I think one of the early interviewees was uh, uh, Roberto Kerki. He makes uh, from Keruk jeans. Uh, you, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. yeah. So I asked him, um, and I don't know if I asked this on camera or not, but I asked him, "Who are your clients?" Um, I mean, you're making jeans, and then you're also making them. 100% by hand you're stitching every single yeah. stitch by crazy that that becomes a very expensive product obviously and so who buys that and what he told me was that the people who buy from me are people who are just like denim crazy basically if i would put it in my words um but the question i want to ask you is why why would I mean we can all think like okay an expensive suit we can kind of like justify that but for for the people who are thinking about jeans and bespoke jeans in particular why do you think as as a jean maker someone would pay a large sum of money for a pair of jeans that they could buy somewhere for like one tenth of the price uh, and and not for example worry about having to make appointments, come back for fittings, I don't know, uh, all of those things. So what would your take be on that? I think it's the same with, with, with clothing. You know, you could just go to into a where a department store and buy a cheap suit for 100 euros mm -hmm. a dollar and, and just, uh, well, you have a suit. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> but that's yeah. all it is, you know? Yeah. And some people go to a several and, and spend 5,000 mm -hmm. uh, pounds on a suit. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's the same with jeans. I mean, some people say, well, a lot of money for jeans. I could just buy them at Primark for, for, for 20 euros. Mm -hmm. Sure mm -hmm. you can, but it, it's it's a different world. It's, it has nothing to do with each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if people just are into tailoring and they commission a suit 
from a decent tailor mm -hmm. and they know the difference between their bespoke suit and a off the rack cheap suit mm -hmm. and they have the shirts made and all the things mm -hmm. and they know what the difference is you know in, in fit mm -hmm. quality and construction why would you just go to a department store and buy some mm -hmm. 50 dollar pair of jeans Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it's your spare time it's it's for the weekend you still you 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 know it doesn't feel good on you yeah yeah if you're used to a good suit you know you know that the fit is superior why would you just for your spare time buy buy cheap shit you know mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i mean a lot of people can't afford it of course but it's the same for, for a lot of things so that's, yeah, that's not yeah. a question that's not a thing and many people that buy my jeans they don't care about the price it's not an issue mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the same for tailoring the same mm -hmm. for other other things in life that are expensive and are, are exclusive and i think the, the, the thing about clothing is bespoke clothing as, as opposed to opposed to a car or a watch whatever mm -hmm. it's expensive this mm -hmm. is made for you yeah so anyone can buy that expensive rolex and just put it on his wrist Mm -hmm. But that's just all the same, you know. But mm. the suit that's made for you is not made for someone else. Yeah, yeah. The same so would you jeans. say, on, on on that note, would you say that the people who buy bespoke jeans or even bespoke clothing in general, do you think, or in your particular case, do you think they care more about the fact that they visit you and you make it for them than they care about the actual final product? Or do you think that they actually care more about the product? It just happens to be made by Paul. I think first they don't care about brands as much. They don't mm -hmm. need, you know, the big names. Yeah. So yeah. they're beyond that. So that that's very fine. I, I had a few customers who, who wanted really uh, a patch with a brand. I, I like we said before, I'm, I'm not a brand. I'm a maker. So I don't mm -hmm. have my name on the outside. It's just on the mm -hmm. inside. So that's the mm -hmm. difference. Some people just want a brand. They want to show up. So mm -hmm. that's not my that's not my client in the end. Yeah, yeah. Some people just come to me because they um, are used to tailoring and want to now dress down. Or also, mm -hmm. post COVID, you know, they don't need to have the suits on five days a week for the office. Mm -hmm. They just want something more casual. Mm -hmm. And they are used to bespoke tailoring, so they just some find me to just mm -hmm. get something more casual that is still of the of the mm -hmm. quality. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there needs to be a connection. You know, if they see what I do to enter mm -hmm. my, on my website, you either like it or you don't. Mm -hmm. If you can't step my face, you're not going to order something from me. I'm <laughs> sure. So that's what I, I just show what I do and, and how I do it. And if you like mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, just come over. And, and so it's, it's the product they like. Mm -hmm. But at first, it's I think they have the feeling that they like what I do, or the mm -hmm. way I do what I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And usually, they like the product, so they come back. That's yeah. that's that's the ideal thing. And then you can just, especially with returning clients, you can just build on. You know, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. start mm -hmm. somewhere and then 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 say, okay, this is okay, but what what's next? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Refine it or do something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I, they're interested in the process as uh, they understand the process as well as the, as the product. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, uh, I said this before we, we started recording, but uh, I, I believe it was around four years ago. I was uh, trying to make a pair of jeans and I, I knew how to make trousers, but I, I thought jeans definitely have a different construction probably. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't want to kind of like open up a pair of jeans and reverse engineer because like you said, most of the jeans that you find on the high street are just like crappy made, you know, it's just like they overlock the edges, they put them on top of each other, they sew. Yeah. And I really wanted to have something more special. So I went on YouTube and I found your videos. And so uh, you, you indirectly taught me how to make jeans at that time. And, and I, if I'm making a pair of jeans now for myself, I still use that method. Uh, maybe a few changes here and there. But 
you ha you don't have apprentices. You don't have students uh, walking around your workshop learning from you. Um, do you ever plan to have students or to have people uh, who can learn from you directly in your workshop? I think I could take just um, having someone around all the, all the time. You know, I think you need to have work for someone to keep busy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think if, in, in my case, if I would have an apprentice that I would have to teach, mm -hmm. it would be too intensive, you know, time-wise mm -hmm. and for me just doing that. Yeah. Uh, I need to have a, a bigger shot, I need to have another machine, maybe whatever. So I think right. the circumstances are not right for that. It's too, too small a, a, a set, set up for an apprentice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would spend all my week trying to get to a point that I could easily do myself in half mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. So it would mm -hmm. not be just, a, I think it's very important, but it would work for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I do think, you know, it's important to, to help people just um, learn about making, in my case, jeans. Mm -hmm. I think, um, in my case, I've learned a lot from just watching YouTube videos, mm -hmm. you know, and setting up the construction for my jeans. Uh, how do you work with a yoke onto the, mm -hmm. the back panel? Mm -hmm. There are several ways of doing that. You know, how do you do this and that? How do you have the construction of the fly? Mm -hmm. I, everything you need to decide on how are you going to do it and, and what's what are the choices, what are the options. Mm -hmm. So I watched numerous numerous videos and, and came up with my own combination of techniques to make it my own. And um, so I think that really helped me get started, you know. Mm -hmm. So you need to have access to information. And there are mm -hmm. no books, as far as I know, I know about making jeans. I do have some books about tailoring, but not about making jeans, mm -hmm. especially not on salvage jeans. So mm -hmm. YouTube was important to me. Um, years ago, a few years ago, I, like you said, we made a video. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a bit about just uh, capturing the whole process from start to finish of making a pair of jeans. Mm -hmm. and not just making something with steam and whatever <laughs> flashy video but really like i like to do just it's a simple setup here and just show mm -hmm. that you know one machine and an iron and, and, and showing the process from step one till till the final part and and um, i th think that proved to be an instructive video because a lot of people have been watching it and commenting on it and saying, mm -hmm. okay, it's an inspiration. So it taught me how to do some things. So I think that serves a bit for me as, as my uh, contribution to, to, I think, uh, teaching maybe. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's, it's uh, something that suits me, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I can imagine doing a talk for a class, but that's just sometimes you know that mm -hmm. i did start to do some private workshops i think last year mm -hmm. and um, the same you know no plan just say okay what what can i do i i said okay i don't want to do a zoom workshop with 20 people mm -hmm. that would yeah. work <laughs> yeah well some people offer it can work but not for me you know and and my work is one-on-one -on -one with the client so that's mm -hmm. that's what i do it's, it's all very mm -hmm. personal so I said, okay i can set up a workshop one-on-one -on -one, so they mm -hmm. have to come into my studio okay let me mm -hmm. sit down no <laughs> yeah and yeah. uh yeah okay that, that, that's reality if you can't come to my workshop it's that's it you know mm -hmm. um so i, I set up a, a schedule for what i what what can i do in two days i think two two days or four or five hours, just go mm -hmm. through the whole process of making a pair of jeans. Mm -hmm. So I, I had a few workshops and, and different people, you know, uh, a woman who was a tailor, classical tailor, who wanted to learn about making jeans mm -hmm. like you, you yourself. Mm -hmm. Someone who is more like a hobby sewer who just didn't get to that point of finishing. So mm -hmm. when you do it one on one, you can really just um, show 
I can show my way of working and mm -hmm. adjust it to what the question is the mm -hmm. student has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's all small scale, of course, you know, one on one, just a few workshops. If if I have the time and if someone else has the question of wanted to mm -hmm. go to a workshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there a lot of... So that's uh, the closest uh, you can get to apprenticeship. Yeah, yeah, I could imagine. I said that's uh, the closest uh, you can get to apprenticing, you know, it's, it's, yeah. 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 Are there other people who are also making bespoke jeans in the Netherlands? I don't think there are anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I said before, there are quite a, a few small brands, mm -hmm. maybe one-man brands, but they would either just um, just design a small collection and have a producer boys call or whatever, mm -hmm. or they would just um, there are a few worldwide that just have a standard collection, mm -hmm. standard sizing, so it would not be bespoke. Like mm -hmm. the, the Italian guy Karuk, uh, his work yeah. is is not bespoke. It's it's a standard pattern. It's an old it's all handwork. But so really bespoke is 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 hard to find. I think mm -hmm. maybe a handful. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, of course, that I think many jeans makers fall back to the classics, mm -hmm. the Levi's, the Lee, the Wranglers, mm -hmm. and also the heritage and and everything that goes around with that you know so they mm -hmm. tend to fall back to the classic machines mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. vintage machines i see i see there's a guy in there ryan martin he's in america who's a wh dangerous who makes great jeans but it's, it's lee inspired let's say inspired and right so there, there are more of those around that just will be just uh, making small batch, maybe to mm -hmm. order, maybe to mm -hmm. measure, but bespoke is, is, is a different thing. Sometimes mm -hmm. you can get something bespoke from more the tailoring side, mm -hmm. but that will be different. I wonder mm -hmm. what it was at a fair in Munich at uh, Blue Zone. Mm -hmm. I had a stand there just to show what I did. And mm -hmm. the, most people there were just uh, fabric, showing the fabrics. And next to me was a guy, an Italian guy, Italian fabric, and he said, well, you need to see this denim. You know, it's so soft and so thin and mm -hmm. whatever. Why do you work with a Japanese stuff? It's a different rule. You, 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 you yeah. can't make a decent pair of jeans with such a nice fabric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's sometimes too nice. if you just, <laughs> too nice, too, too, no, too Italian, too, too refined, too even. Mm -hmm. So if you just um, sometimes have something bespoke, from the tailoring side of the high-end men's stores, it's 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 too much based on made to match bespoke of the, the classic tailoring industry. Mm -hmm. And that's not a pair of jeans. It's mm -hmm. different. They, yeah, they yeah. shouldn't be too nice. It's still, you know, like the small makers really go back to the old brands and that is what it's still based on. Same mm -hmm. as for me, only on with my way of working but it's still a pair of jeans it's still something mm -hmm. that needs to it needs it needs wear and tear you know it, mm -hmm. it's, it's not something you send to the dry cleans and have ironed at the time yeah it's yeah, not a pair yeah, of trousers yeah yeah i can imagine that so i'd like to do a speed round with you but before i do the speed round i want to ask you a question because i know i'm going to forget it and the question is um, you, I, I've seen photos where you leave the gimp on the buttonholes extended past, past the bar tag. Can, can you tell me what, what your uh, reason is behind that? Because I couldn't think of, of any reason than aesthetic. But, uh, but, but, yeah, well, uh, the thing is, you know, the, the only thing I could do on my machine, on my one mm -hmm. machine, was make yeah. a buttonhole. I could right. skip the overlocking and just make felt seams all over and do some taping yeah the only thing i had to learn my first yeah. step into proper tailoring was how to make a buttonhole by hand yeah so yeah. that was really yeah. a challenge in the first year yeah and i needed to find out what is a gimp i found out yeah. okay so i got it's not even what you would consider a gimp i think mostly synthetic or it's just a thread that's waxed this is yeah. a really quite a thick thread 
waxed. Yeah. But the jeans is a bit more firm than a suit mm -hmm. jacket, so it needs to be a bit more, a mm -hmm. bit more than that. And I thought, well, now you can just going back to before mm -hmm. my tailoring life. Now I used to be, like I said, a designer, mm -hmm. and I used to like you know Bauhaus, you know Bauhaus. Yeah, yeah. German movement. It's less is more, you know. Miss van der Rohe and things. That was my inspiration. You know, just less is more. Yeah. Everything is there for for a reason. Form follows function. Mm -hmm. Same with my jeans. Everything mm -hmm. that is there has a reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's also I was all say my my jeans are also form follows function. And mm -hmm. uh, the gimp has a has a, has a function. Mm -hmm. to get a bit of body and strength to, to, to the butthole. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, why not show it, you know? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. too thick just to go through the fabric and, and just put it in. You can just cut it off short. But yeah, I like it when things are decorative, but not just yeah. for decoration. If it's there yeah. for a reason and it shows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's I think almost that's white again. Yeah, yeah. It's similar to leaving perhaps a little piece of lining open so that you can see the canvas on the inside of a jacket. Uh, for instance, or just no, no lining at all, and you can just open up the, the, the face yeah. and you can see the canvas in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. So I do uh, like to see I, I do like to, to understand why something I, why I do like to understand why things are done in a certain way. And if, mm -hmm. if your construction can show that it's nice. Yeah, yeah, because it's funny because the the first time I was watching the video, you were doing the buttonhole, and then you left the gimp, and I and I was sitting behind the screen. And I was like, cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it, <laughs> come <laughs> on, cut it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was funny. But it's, it's yeah, it's good to, uh, good yeah. for me to know. Um, okay, let's let's do a speed run. So I've written a few things based on our conversation now and. Uh, I'm very curious to see what you say. So in one word, the first thing that comes up your mind. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. So yeah, sure. Art. Not crafts. Not craft. Okay. Technique. Uh, means to an end. Means to an end. Very interesting. Fashion. Fashion. Uh, yeah. I prefer style. Prefer style. Limitations. Challenge. Challenge. Gym. Machines. Uh, necessity. Necessity. YouTube. Um, can be very annoying, but can also be very very uh informative okay okay favorite musician oh my god um i think uh, bowie, bowie all the way oh uh, yeah yeah okay you know david bowie no yeah yes i do i do i do <laughs> yes um alterations i hate it <laughs> I'd rather begin, a, a, rather begin something new than old, alteration, doing alterations. Yeah, hey, same here. We share that for sure. Yeah. So, so who would you like to make a pair of jeans for? That's very hard, you know? Mm. I, I think I don't care. I would have liked to make a pair for David Bowyer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe but <laughs> yeah but yeah. i'm not sure no i don't care as long as it's no no i, I couldn't tell there's not a person no, it would depend on, on who the person is not, not what he is I, i'm not sure okay uh, okay okay we'll, we'll take david bowie for an answer <laughs> uh, um let's see uh, apprenticeships um i think it can be important but it's i think it can also be something that is, is looked up on how would you say that maybe it's, it's made more important than it is oh sure. overvalued you, can, you, you think it's overvalued maybe overvalued i think you can get your information anywhere interesting interesting okay okay that's I mean, very, maybe very... depending on, on the yeah i think so be yeah well depends on the person i think but mm -hmm. 
you've talked about a lot. I think a lot of tailors just are very uh, reluctant in, in, in sharing information. So you, you end up apprenticing for five years and still know just a little. And maybe mm -hmm. you could have acquired that information within mm -hmm. a year's time if you just had multiple sources. So absolutely, yeah, yeah. I never apprenticed, so I don't know, but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I fully agree. Um, the most difficult thing about being an individual craftsman. Mm. I'm not sure. Uh, I think. That's a hard one. I'm not sure how hard it is. <laughs> if you if you like what you do and you do it well, that that's mm -hmm. all you need. And you need, of course, you need it to land with your clients. So mm -hmm. if you have your clients, it's okay. If you don't have it, it's it's just well, you're just working for yourself. But uh, mm -hmm. I think the hard thing is to just stay on top of it, you know, and to, to stay mm -hmm. informed. I think. Mm, okay, okay. Um, I have two more. Instagram. Uh, like you, it's very annoying as mm -hmm. a, a viewer on Instagram because I, I, if I open it three times a day, it's all the same one is on top. So the, the whole algorithm is, is horrible. Yeah. But I think it's, it has been very important for me just as a, a showcase of what I do. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a necessity, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then last but not least, Paul Kruiser. You can you, you pronounce it well. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, somewhere hovering between uh, tailoring and jeans. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, on that note, Paul, this was a fantastic conversation. Thank, Thank you for right. making the time. And uh, so I hope to visit me. you when I'm next in the Netherlands. You'll be very welcome. It'll be very nice. Thank you Thank so you much. Paul. Bye Thank bye. You, Reza. And that was Paul. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation. If you'd like to see more of Paul, you can follow the links to his website and Instagram in the description of this video. If you have any thoughts, questions or comments, please let us know. And we sure hope to see you again in the next episode. Until then, bye bye. <laughs>